Hi everybody, <clears throat> this is another day and uh, we are at the second segment of the late Paleozoic chapter and I stopped the first segment right here where I showed you the present day oceanic currents and we have very, as you can see, we have really extremely well developed currents in our oceans. The reason for it is that the, the climate is really, you know, the, the weather is very cold in the north and in the south and uh, it's pretty warm in the equator area right here so therefore there is a big temperature uh, difference which actually starts the currents because if you think about it the colder the water the more dense it is so it goes down the warmer the wa water the less dense it is so it comes up which makes the currents going around and, and being pretty active so uh, if you think about that's the Coriolis effect and other things that always you got the cold current on the west side of the continents and the warm currents going up on the east side of the continents that's why the United States is relatively warm even in May in the summer you can even swim up there because of the Gulf current going up north on the other hand if you think of California and um, Oregon and those guys you can never really swim because the ocean is always relatively cold because of the cold current the other interesting thing about this is that if you go to England you know England is pretty cold you, you throughout the year also because of the presence of the oceanic currents so now we're going to talk about the the black shale which remember I told you is the so-called Chattanooga shale um, in the Devonian when the oceans are stratified. Uh, this Chattanooga shale is not only interesting because it's a stratified ocean but also because actually it, it contains uh, uranium and the, the uranium content of the black shale is about 70 gram per metric, metric ton uh, with a density of 2.5 metric metric tons per cubic meter of course you don't have to know this uh, this would be about 175 gram of uranium per cubic meter which would mean uh, about 875 grams per square meter so that's why if you go to Chattanooga Tennessee you can find museums about the the uranium and the um, energy getting you know the energy can get out of uranium and at the beginning you know the big physicist uh, used to work in Chattanooga Tennessee on the on the wonder bomb the nuclear bomb so that's where it all started because of this uranium deposit there in the black shale so now we are at the late Kaskaskia this is the time when actually the Kaskaskia sea started to regress the black shale remember was the peak transgression so now we have regression that just means that North America is in the tropics so therefore during this time the the limestone came back like the carbonate rocks this this limestone is also very very uh, fossil rich it has crinoids you can see this this white low things and a lot of if you look at it close up most of the grains in this rock is crinoids but it also have oolitic limestone and dolomite um, when the regression really reached the lowermost level the whole continent was emerged some quartz sandstone formation happened also and quartz sandstone is just as good oil reservoir as oolitic limestone would be so it was very important in the Illinois basin uh the next segment is the Absaroka and the Absaroka sequence goes from Pennsylvania to all the way to the Jurassic so it goes out of the Paleozoic if you remember your time scale I hope you are so the last last of the Paleozoic is the Permian and after the Permian what comes yeah the Mesozoic and inside the Mesozoic you have Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous so this guy is going all the way to the Jurassic so it goes into the Mesozoic um, of course the the unconformity uh, 
uh, the unconformity between Kaskaska and Absaroka will divide the Carboniferous into Mississippi and Pennsylvania because it happens just right there. Uh, it already the fallout basin already started before, but by this time it's really well formed. It's major, um, so it defines the whole Appalachian area at this time. So here is the Absaroka geography, and you can see that this is this huge, huge mountain area right here. And the Foreland Basin is right around this area in North America. So if you want to see the cross section, here we are. This is Avalonia. This is the, uh, the low continent island dot, which is colliding into North America soon. And this is the mountains on the beach, like Colorado. I have mentioned that before you, before that. And this here is the Foreland Basin, this area. Now you have to imagine that the Foreland Basin gets a lot of sediment from the mountains. So those are going to be very um, immature, very unsorted. Um, and on the other side, we don't, the, the basin doesn't get much sediment from the east. So therefore the carbonate formation is, is, is going on on this side. But on this side, you have to imagine there is a lot of influence from the from the mountains. But also, this is the time when actually the Gondwana area is down south, so we have an ice age. Uh, and because of that, the sea level changes are pretty prominent, and it's very, very, very frequent. So we got uh, frequent sea level changes here, and that really influences the, the cycloterms of this time. So as I just mentioned it, if we want to talk about the sedimentation in this foreland basin, then on the east side we have fast subsidence and cycloterms are, are uh, forming, where on the west side uh, it's gentle sloping and the carbonate deposit deposition is, is still going on. Uh, as I said, we have to talk about the cycloterms of this time. Ooh, I closed up for myself. The cycloterms. The cycloterms are basically alternating marine and non-marine deltic sediment as the result of the sea level changes. I just told you all this. So I want you to imagine being in Everglades. You all know where is Everglades. It's in Florida. It's a swamp. It's a coastal swamp and where coal is forming as we speak. Okay, here is Everglades. What happens when the sea level goes up? You're right, Everglades become under under the seawater because it's higher, so therefore it's going to flood Everglades. You understand? So it will be marine deposits on the coal. Now what happens if the sea level goes down and it reaches where it is today? Yeah, the whole area becomes a swamp again. What happens if the sea level goes and drops? It becomes dry land. Yeah, you're right. And then when the sea level starts going back again, you're going to have another swamp. And then it goes further down, and you're going to have marine sediment. Then the sea level goes down, you're going to have coastal swamp. And then when it drops, it's going to be a uh, continent. So I hope you understand every 20,000 years where the sea level went up and down, it produced a small amount of coal followed by marine sediment, then some more coal, followed by continental sediment, followed by some coal. So all the Appalachian coal has all these layers, you know, so when they were mining for the coal, they had to deal with all these other rocks too, the marine and non-marine sedimentary rocks. Each coal seam was just some inches high, about this, like 10 inches high. Uh, so it's a very hard mining, if you think about it. And on top of it, all these coal beds got folded and faulted, you know, because of all the collision during this time. So when they do the coal mining, there's a lot of problems they have to deal with. Sometimes the coal beds are going upside down. Sometimes they turn around, they making um, anticlines, inclines. Then there is a fault. So there is a lot of problem with the coal mining. You got to understand that. Now, this is the original sedimentation so these are the swamp areas right here and between them you have 
marine and non-marine sediment depends on where the sea level is at the time and you know if you look at later on with the erosion of streams and stuff this is how it looks like and that's a typical coal seam right here and if you go on 77 in West Virginia you can see a lot of coal seam actually sticking out of the ground and this is just another way of showing the the this here shows you the sea level and then you can see the coal seams like all over here so I hope you understand the, the coal formation now this is here another coal seam and you understand that this Appalachian coal is everywhere uh, actually I it's in the Appalachian area but the formation of the coal happened during the Pennsylvanian I want you to remember not in the Mississippian it is in the Pennsylvanian so remember uh, coal formation in the Appalachians, the Appalachian coal complex happened during the Pennsylvanian. Okay, so you will remember this. I'm going to ask it on the test. Now, this coal is not from plants like you would think of today. These guys, these plants were actually ferns. I should write it here, ferns. And the ferns of this time were really like a forest so you have to imagine those low ferns which now underneath of the tree in the undergrowth actually made the forest so they were like 30 and more feet high and this shows you a carboniferous forest actually and this is the swampy environment and as it gets covered up and it gets under the uh, sediments it gradually will become better and better coal so at the beginning it's peat and then as it gets more and more buried it will become lignite right here so peat peat lignite the bituminous coal and some of it sometimes becomes metamorphosed and that's what we call anthracite you remember that actually this time was a major time for uh, coal formation and as you see this map, Scotese's map, it, it's really showing uh, all the low green triangles are showing the areas where you had major coal formation. Uh, the red triangles actually are showing rather dry climate areas with concrete or caliche soil formation. So the greens are all the coal formations during this time, the, the Pennsylvania and the Carboniferous. And now we're going back to our uh, sequences. But before that, you have to understand that all the continents are colliding. Now we are really in the late Carboniferous, so Pangaea is very close to being um, finished. So you have to imagine that there is collision everywhere. Collision is everywhere. And so as the, as the continents are colliding, they actually pushing up the middle of the continent. So this is how the ancestral rock is forming right here. As the result of this uplifting, uh, the old red sandstone in Colorado have formed. And this is actually a pretty amazing area. I don't know if you've been in Colorado around Denver, uh, around uh, Garden of Gods. You can see it, it's really, really beautiful. This is a couple of my pictures when I went with my students to the Garden of Gods. This is that typical red sandstone which formed uh, during the ancestral Rockist time. And now we are at the late Absaroka. You have to understand that this is the time when uh, the regression become pretty major. Oh, actually before that I have this one um, slide before I get to that uh, I started to tell you so I have to step back and um, as soon as the ancestral rock is formed of course sediment started to erode away from the mountains and there was a lot of sedimentary basin around the ancestral rockies which actually filled up by the sediment weathering from the mountains uh, one of the best example for this kind of sedimentary basin is the paradox basin and the Paradox Basin located in the Four Corner region. Uh, you know, the Four Corner region is where Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado meets. And I have a map. I 
thought I had a map, but I don't. So it's in the four corner region. What is interesting in the in the paradox basin that um, we do have a lot of uh, cyclical deposits, and it starts with gypsum. That was a very very arid time, and um, there was a lot of gypsum and hydrite and salt in the central basin area, and after that. Uh, there was fossiliferous and oolitic limestones and it had patch and barrier reefs also and so this really restricted the central basin which was which was becoming a very good oil reservoir during the um, the late Pennsylvania this whole basin was filled by arcosic red sandstone and there was the salt below the sandstone and what is interesting about the salt that it's less dense than any other rocks. So what happens as the salt actually starts, uh, gets buried, the salt actually starts to come up and push through the layer. I have to change this color. Push through the layers and uh, actually as you can see it makes this uh, anticline like structure. But really, it's nothing but salt dome tectonic, we call it. Salt dome tectonic. It's really amazing that originally the salt was layered down like that. And then, because the salt is less dense than the other rocks, it just come through. It's pretty amazing. And this is how the arches, a lot of the arches have formed. This here is one of the famous delicate arch. Not one of the famous, the famous delicate arch. And right here, we're sitting on one of these huge, big uh, anticline, which was pushed up by the salt underneath. And uh, as you can see right here, this used to be a big salt dome. But of course, then it collapsed. This one is still a salt dome. This, this slide shows you salt domes in other areas, like in the Zagros Mountain in Iran. This is a typical salt dome right here, and there is another one. You can actually almost see the salt in there. It's very, very interesting. In the Gulf of Mexico, we have a lot of oil reservoir related to, to salt domes which formed during the beginning of the, the Gulf of Mexico, which was in the Triassic and Jurassic, actually. So this here is the one which shows the four corner region right here. See, that's uh, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. That's the four corner, remember? I hope, I mean, you will remember. Uh, so this is Utah, this is Colorado, this is Arizona, and New Mexico. Uh, the Paradox Basin study was done for finding oil, oil, um, there is about 75 small oil fields, but each of them can produce 2 to 10 million barrels of oil. Uh, 